Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our Wednesday webinar titled, We're Speaking With Your Guests. Uh, this is Randy Jocelyn from Gateway Ticketing. Uh, we're delighted to have you guys here. We are gonna get started on your screen, by the way, is some information about your uh, upcoming uh, webinar for next, uh, for two weeks from to now. As you know, we've been doing these every two weeks. So if, if you're new to our party, welcome. We're super excited to have you. Um, come and join the party again two weeks from today. So uh, if you've been on our webinars, we, we know uh, that it, we love question and answer. So we absolutely want you to be encouraged to ask some questions. And this is the time I'm actually going to put us to work already. So if you're using our, our tool here, you can see it if you're not on the dial in, but if you're on our, our, our actual webinar uh, through your PC or Mac or, or device, there's a Q&A button and then you could select QA and type a question. So what I really was hoping to do is take this moment to, to think of any question that you might have, any question that you would love to ask your guests, like, um, hey, what, what do you feel about um, only being open five days a week? Or what do you feel about you know, changing our hours from day to day? What, how would that go over? Because we've got a great panelist, uh, panel of, uh, of guests, uh, people that have been in too many, many attractions. So uh, this is a time where I'm asking you, fill in your questions now so we can start asking uh, these great people these questions. So uh, that's how you ask uh, questions and we will do our best to answer them on the webinar or via typing. If it's a gateway ticketing related question, we got our awesome team here to help you out as well. Um, so if you are, um, as you know, the agenda for these webinars, it's 90 minutes in length. It's got a lot of Q and A, um, community discussions will have plenty of time toward the end. As always, if you are a member of the press, uh, we would love you to identify yourselves now. Um, actually, uh, we have our friend Marcus Gaines joining us from the BBC as a panelist today. So uh, cat's out of the bag. He's uh, kind of a member of the press as well and a attraction enthusiast. But if you are a member of the press, please let us know in the chat window who you are so we can uh, fill that in. And thank you for already getting some questions coming in. Um, that's, that's great. We got some good ones. Um, okay, so um, this series, why, why, are, why are we still doing these? It's because you have continually given us a lot of feedback that you want to hear more about best practices, more about what the guests and capacity management. And so this little word cloud kind of covers some of the things that we've been trying to target. Um, so uh, if you have any other future ideas of what you want us to talk about, please let us know as well. Um, so it's, it's great to put that information there. Um, also, um, this is part of our ongoing Gateway Ticketing community. So you can come and visit gatewayticketing.com uh, slash community, and you can see all of our past webinars. So this is, I believe, number 17. Uh, we also have a series called Tuesday Talks that's more geared for our Gateway Ticketing customers, um, but these are all available online on our community. Um, Great. Well, my name is Randy uh, Jocelyn. I'm a member of the principal team here at Gateway. I have a hyper focus with wildlife and conservation, and I'm joined by my co-moderator and uh, partner in crime, Matthew Hohenstein. So, Matthew, uh, why don't you take it away and introduce yourself and the rest of our, our, our team on the, on the webinar today? Thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, and, and many thanks, Judy, Jamie, Terry, uh, Ella is getting those questions in. We really appreciate it and, and looking for more of y'all to, to uh, throw some questions in there. Um, so as Randy mentioned, my name is Matthew Hohenstein. I'm with Gateway Ticketing Systems as well. Um, my focus is with a lot of our uh, destination attractions um, and, uh, and working with them to, to solve business problems. But I think what I'm most excited about are, are all these other folks that are with us today. Um, and our, our first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Ben. Uh, ben is a co-founder of the DLP Report, um, which is a, a, a site that's uh, dedicated to, to following and celebrating everything at Disneyland Paris. Uh, so he's joining us today. We also have Andrew. Um, Andrew's a, uh, a, a co-host on the In the Loop podcast um, and a, a super, super fan of all of the things in the attractions world. So Andrew, uh, welcome. Um, Marcus, as Randy mentioned, is, is joining us. He's a uh, the co-founder and director of uh, uh, video production with uh, Ride and Park Media. Um, I think what's most exciting, though, were the five jobs that he listed in Twitter that he's had, um, which was one, Santa's Elf for Santa, uh, two, a fire breather for various TV commercials, 
a sound engineer for Disney, pyrotechnician, working on over 250 UK shows, um, and then I think his current role, theme park video producer for Ride and Park Media. So we're super glad to have Marcus here um, and who's been following uh, of the community for quite a while. And our, uh, we also have Carly, um, and Carly has a, a great history in the attractions industry. Not only is she a fan of attractions, um, but she's had the opportunity to work in several of them, uh, some of the Merlin attractions. Um, and then in her day-to-day -day work today, um, she's helping uh, attractions in the United Kingdom and across the world in uh, solving uh, business problems as well. So welcome, Carly. And then to round out the team, uh, we have two other folks from Gateway. We've got Carrie, uh, our learning solutions instructor that's kind of helping us out and helping host uh, today's webinar. Uh, she's got a great operational experience with the Cedar Fair Parks um, prior to her joining the Gateway and brings a lot of that insight to, uh, to, th to our discussion. And then also um, our marketing manager, uh, Mr. Greg, is uh, also behind uh, the scenes making uh, magic happen. So, that's everybody that we've got today, and we have many, many of you joining us, and we're super excited for that. Uh, so we'll start off with just going through a couple things that we've noticed that have happened in the industry um, since the last time we talked. Uh, quick update. And the first one that I ran across was in Singapore, and this was at uh, Universal's Park in Singapore have, has recently announced that they're implementing facial recognition um, in their effort to improve the entry experience for both pass holders and then re-entry of single day tickets. Now, for those of y'all that are, are thinking this looks a little familiar, this is in addition to Universal's Park in Beijing that back in October announced that they were going to be implementing facial recognition um, using Alibaba, um, you know, focusing on both park entry as well as carrying that through to the entire in-park experience, like making payments and picking up um, things out of lockers. Um, so it's really interesting what the, the movement that we're seeing related to, to facial recognition from these two uh, universal parks. Obviously, there's a lot of positives about that of, you know, in, in this COVID-19 world, it's, it's an effort to reduce contact. Um, there's probably some labor savings that, that you know, if, if I don't have to man every access control point. Um, but obviously across the, the world, I think this is, is looked at in very different lights um, when it comes to privacy and the, the concerns around that. So um, a, a lot of times we see in the Asian parks that there's much more higher tolerance for that level of um, um, experience, um, but maybe in some of the European uh, parks or in the United States, there's a little bit more of a hesitancy there. So it'll be interesting to see how that continues to evolve. One of the other um, exciting things we ran across was um, something that Dollywood had done. And, you know, this really uh, struck a chord with me because in, in my past experience, I spent a lot of time in doing pricing and in and, and sales channels, uh, third party sales channel management. So obviously attractions have historically focused on the corporate market market. Um, to both pr uh, promote local offers and um, leveraging key distributors like Entertainment Benefits Group to gain a foothold in the corporate perks programs of companies across the globe. So it's, it's a, a vital um, distribution channel for many parks. What's interesting that, you know, Dollywood recently launched this new promotion that leverages that corporate market and focuses on the essential workers um, where employees of those businesses can get a $39 ticket offer. Um, so I found this pretty interesting because it's a, it's a pretty significant discount. It's $40 off of their online price, and it's even more significant than their military discount. Um, but I think it's, one, helping them from a distribution standpoint, and two, it's really a great um, group to rally behind. You know, all of these folks that during lockdowns and during um, the height of the pandemic um, were really vital to us having, having society continue on um, and, and recognizing them in a, in a proper way. And Matthew, that's something yeah. that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and I really do like that I, about defining those essential workers and really lifting them up onto that pedestal that they belong on. And it is, it's really great that we're starting to see people really welcome the, those those frontline essential workers and, and welcome them and, and give them a great deal. So that's it's an amazing offer. Very true. We've also unfortunately had to see some parks make some difficult operational decisions. Um, so we've seen some changes announced as a result of the ongoing uh, pandemic conditions here in the United States, uh, specifically Universal Orlando uh, Resort and Universal Studios Hollywood announced that their annual Halloween event will be canceled for 2020. This would have been the 30th anniversary of Orlando's Halloween Horror Nights. 
Uh, similarly, Knott's Berry Farm has had to cancel its Knott's Scary Farm due to the uncertainty in California for large attractions to resume their normal operations. And then other attractions like Dutch Wonderland have begun refining their operating calendars based on the current attendance trends, as well as the upcoming reduction as we look for schools in the United States to resume um, operation. So it's unfortunate, um, but obviously having to make those tough decisions to ensure the, the long-term stability of the organization is, is key. Yeah, and I would say, and adding on to that, uh, yesterday was a really busy day. Uh, you guys, um, we, there was a, a variety of messages that really went out simultaneously from the Cedar Fair properties. And um, the, what's really significant here is that they, they reached that point of the conversation of, well, there's this, the profitability position is just not there. So uh, you can see from, these are some links, um, they're almost all very similar messages, all from the vice president and GM of each of the attractions, uh, Valley Fair, Carowinds, Kings Dominion, and Great America. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. You know, I, I do love the program that they put in place. If you haven't gone to these websites, they've done a great job putting together an FAQ. What does this mean for members? What does it, I mean, pass holders, what does it mean for folks that have charitable tickets? Um, they have a, a special offer for I think it's the pre-K pre like season pass offer and they automatically extended all those, which is a really great thing. They didn't have to do that. Um, everyone's aging up, but basically that means if you normally would have moved into a paid pass and you're in that maybe four or five year old age, they're gonna give you a free year as well. So I would encourage everybody to check out the language and the FAQ. I think they did a really good job. It's also interesting to note, they also announced that Worlds of Fun and Dorney Park are gonna be closing at Labor Day and then um, the remainder of the parks, like Knott's Berry Farm, it's still, who, who knows what's gonna happen there? Are they gonna be able to open? It's a 365 day park, but we have seen uh, previous updates about uh, not really pushing and, and going all in on their Taste of Calico experience, which is what they offered previously. And now they're opening up the eating experience throughout most of the attraction. Um, so th there's a, some really interesting changes of direction that we're seeing out of uh, Cedar Fair. Moving on, um, there's some information about places that are opening again or, or preparing to open for the first time. I think we've said this a lot, but having great pre-opening communication is, is, is working wonders. This is a really great video here um, from, um, this is the West Edmonton Mall. And it's a great little video walking through um, their plans and steps to reopen. And I, I really like, I mean, my kids would, love Hello Kitty Land here. I'm just watching the experience, but really getting the, the characters to interact as they prepare to reopen, uh, welcoming everybody back. So some really great little videos that we'll share with all of you guys in our, our channel. Another, the sister park to West Edmonton Mall, Mall of America, um, is, is opening differently. So it's a reopening with limits. So this is Nickelodeon Universe at Mall of America. If you've ever been here, this was an open attraction where you would just pay to play certain rides and attractions. So they've, been, they've changed. They are now uh, significantly reducing capacity and they're selling two hour blocks. So they're gonna allow 250 people in. You have to pay for entry and reserve that time. And it's now not a free entry area. So they've had to change the, I, I haven't really seen too much about how they're doing it, but they've had to change kind of the whole operational experience, how they've traditionally run just to have access and walk through that area. So that's a big change of direction for Nickelodeon Universe. Um, a cool thing I ran across over at Europa Park in Germany um, was the gamification of doing the right thing during uh, a pandemic. Uh, so this was an exciting app that they have out there that's called Distance Radar. Um, and really what they do, and they encourage the visitors of the park to, to utilize this app. And then um, you kind of get this, this dial that lets you know how well you're doing at physically distancing from everyone else. Um, and obviously, you know, just, just giving you a dial is, is one way um, to, to measure that, but then they even reward you. And, you know, folks that stay in the green have the opportunity to win um, expedited attraction access on to, to certain attractions. Um, so I thought it was a, an exciting way to see uh, that come to life and to encourage uh, folks to do the, the, the things that we need them to do while they're visiting our attractions. And Randy, I think you'd run across some stuff over at Great Wolf Lodge. 
Yeah, this is just another um, good example. This is another great resource to look into. Um, you know, um, it, it is, it's another great tool. I feel like as attractions reopen, um, it's important to look and see and, and experience with everything that we, we can do to open safely. But we haven't talked too much about like hotel, water parks. Um, they're an area uh, where you traditionally are thinking there's a lot of people in a small space um, because they're not as huge as, as many of the water parks. But they're really talking about some of their great sanitation efforts that they're, they're underlining. Um, being a water park guy, um, it was one of the concerns about how do you have an indoor water park with some of the challenges of so many different touch points. Of course, uh, a lot of great studies about chlorine and the acid and, and kind of being really a disinfectant in and of itself. But there are some, some interesting things in this article about like the life jacket. But, you know, is, is, it, is it sanitized? Um, it seems, you know, what, what do I do when I get a life jacket? Well, really here the idea is that you're going to get a life jacket if you need one at the beginning. And if you ever need to, to exchange one, they have a whole sanitation protocol that they're using special safe solutions for the life jacket so that you know that your, your little one is going to be safe and protected. So it's a good read about some of the changes that we're seeing over at Great Wolf Launch. Oh, and this is really interesting. And Matthew, I, I, I think we can both talk about this. And it's, this is really interesting about how, how they're at Cedar Point, they're staying open, but they've really also had to adjust their experiences. And there's also something really interesting happening where, where they actually need employees. Um, although some places have furloughed and cut employees, it's really interesting to hear about their employee needs. Yeah, so here I thought one of the, one of the key elements I took away from this is they, they had to make the decision to, to close their evening Halloween event or not have it this year. And I think that there's probably a lot of, uh, of merit in that, you know, it's, it's a dark situation. It's a situation where normally you're getting close to other people. Uh, scares are normally highly related to the fact that someone got into my um, you know, area of, of personal space. Um, but rather than kind of just walk away from that experience and the significant revenue that's probably tied to it, they, they looked for ways to um, reimagine that. And so, you know, they've, they're going out this year with a tricks and treats fall fest. Um, so I think it's a really innovative way to kind of say, hey, this is, this is still an important time for us. And we know that there's a lot of demand for folks to come out. Um, how do we reimagine it to fit the conditions that we have to live in? And then, Randy, yes, to your point, um, obviously, we're having some record unemployment here in the United States. Um, however, we've also had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, changes where in, in bringing international folks to the market. So, you know, parks like um, Cedar Point that may have relied on that more heavily um, are now having to, you know, recruit more heavily um, in their local market. So just this morning in looking at their website, there were 37 different jobs. Um, open and that's you know obviously there's they need more than one person in each one of those jobs um, so it's really you know a, a sign I think of what's happening in the labor market with attractions yeah and there are, it's, I've also heard that you know a lot of staff members are able to to work at you know this location so it really is an advantage to have multiple sites in this example so they can reallocate staff to different attractions and I don't think that's really the case for most attractions but where they are they're taking advantage of that opportunity there. Yeah, and Matthew, I just want to also highlight, I think something that they um, did really well here uh, is that they renamed the event um, instead of kind of coming out and saying like, hey, it's, you know, whatever, you know, the fall event, um, the fall fest event, but different. Um, they're com this is a complete new branding for them as well. So I think that that's something to really, you know, kind of think about as you're reimagining that experience. It, it definitely sets the guest expectation by, um, just putting that new name out, maybe it's just for this year, like maybe it's something that grows into something different, but uh, I think that's something for, for hopefully people on the call to kind of take away of uh, it's a really good way to, to reset the expectation of, hey, this is going to be different. The hours aren't going to be the same. The experience isn't going to be the same. Um, so I think that that's, you know, kudos to them for, for recognizing that branding piece is really important in setting guest expectation. That's a great point. Um, you know, this is something else that it's interesting about expectations. Uh, everyone, we're seeing these videos of probably the greatest experience that some of these, these guests are having is at a reopened attraction like Disney World. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting to note that according to this blog and some other blogs that I've been reading, we're starting to see and hear about a, a notch up of wait times 
However, both Disney and other attractions are saying they're not adding more people, but that the weights are increasing. Um, this is from a fan site, so you can see that there's a, a site, thrilldata.com, where they're aggregating some of these wait time data. And it's not a huge amount, but it's, it's really great. If you go to this article, you can see that, like, the average wait times are 20, 25 minutes. And I'm over here thinking, that's fantastic. Let's go, you know, because 20, 25 minutes to ride one of your favorite rides and attractions is, is, is a great, great experience. So we do know a lot of people are having a good time. But it also kind of tells something to me about maybe how they're operating. Um, you know, obviously, maybe, and we'll, we'll probably talk about this with our team um, as we get going, but maybe you're operating with less ride vehicles. Um, so how does that look from a guest experience? If you maybe have less ride vehicles or you're spacing out um, heavily so you're not loading as much or you're sanitizing um, a, a lot in between um, rides uh, cycle. So it would be interesting to hear about what does that really mean from the guest perspective as you, uh, as you do reopen. Well, Randy, I think it's perfect then that we have a, a bunch of folks that have been visiting parks and that can help us to understand truly what that guest experience is like and what their perception is. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work that attraction operators go through to create the experience that they think that they're going to deliver. Um, but it's really that experience that a guest takes and, and, and is truly experiences that's what matters because that's what they leave and walk out the door with. Um, so I gave you a very, very high level introduction to each of our panelists, um, but I'd love to have them have an opportunity to talk about themselves a little bit more and kind of, you know, some of their initial experiences um, right now. And then we're going to go through and, and, and address a lot of the questions that you had and some other questions that we've put together uh, for the panelists as well. So, Ben, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Ben, I'm with DLP Report, and uh, what we do is we report daily on everything that's happening at Disneyland Harris, from entertainment to operations, news, um, anything that's happening. So, of course, uh, the reopening has been a huge time for us, especially after four months of nothing. Um, and um, now we're back reporting in the parks every day. That's great. Uh, I've been a big fan of, of your site ever since um, you, you started it and uh, love, love the information that you put out and, and just wish that I was able to um, be out there experiencing the park as frequently as y'all are because that's uh, amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, Andrew, um, and Andrew has, has gotten, uh, I, I was quite, quite shocked whenever um, we were talking <laughs> with him about the number of attractions that he has visited since the pandemic um, ended, or well, I guess it didn't end, but since attractions were able to reopen um, after the pandemic. So Andrew? Yeah, so I, um, I actually I just moved here to Atlanta. So I think it was partly uh, wanting to get out and uh, experience attractions, but also at the same time, uh, oh, oh, I haven't been to all these places uh, right by my house now. I wanna go check it out. So I think that's probably why I ended up going to quite a few attractions here, but yeah, I am uh, the co-host of the In The Loop podcast. Uh, it's been a podcast that's, been around for about eh, about 16, 17 years, kind of even before podcasts were a thing. And we talk all about um, everything uh, in the attractions industry. So, uh, but yeah, over the last few, uh, few months here, I had the opportunity to go to quite a few different parks and, um, you know, had quite a few different experiences I'm looking forward to sharing today. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and then joining us from um, the United Kingdom is um, Marcus. Marcus, welcome, um, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I, it's strange times, really. But um, uh, So I have a company that produces promotional films uh, for theme parks and ride manufacturers. I typically spend about 60 days a year in a theme park somewhere in the world. Uh, this now is the longest that I've been stuck in the UK uh, since 2010. I haven't been in one country for this length of time for a decade, and it's very strange. Um, it, at the moment, I'm doing quite a few shifts with BBC News, so I've been very much on the front line, uh, very much stuck into what's going on in the world with the pandemic. So it's all been quite depressing. So I was quite relieved when 4th of July, finally in the UK, theme parks and fun fairs could reopen and uh, I could take the kids out and get a bit of normality again and actually see them smiling rather than them worrying and getting upset that they're not having any fun. Um, so I think the important thing to remind all the attractions out there is we are so glad you're open and we're so glad you're helping us to create 
create great family memories again. Yeah, Marcus, I, I love the photo that you had shared with us of, of you and um, I think your your sons on on the ride for the first time after how long was, was that the the first experience they had um, outside? Was, so uh, the, the two boys hadn't been anywhere except school because my partner's a nurse and myself working in news. We were both key workers, so the kids carried on going to school, and the only place they had been is to school at home. Uh, or to the, the, the country park. They hadn't been anywhere else, they hadn't been in any shops or anything like that. So for them, their first experience of being out in the real world, so to speak, was at a fun fair. And I mean, you can see the smile on their faces and see just how special it was for them to actually get a bit of fun and normality again. Yeah, I think that the joy and the excitement that, that's coming across on their faces and, and in their actions is truly what excites me about being in this industry. I mean, it's it's bringing that happiness to folks. So. Appreciate you sharing that. And I think that's um, the important thing for everyone to remember is it is everybody really being. Yes, sir. Um, now, uh, also joining us from the United Kingdom is Carly. Um, Carly, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. And Hi, um, so I'm Carly. I'm a um, ticketing and tourism consultant. So I help normally in the, in the previous world. I help tourist attractions find uh, technological, usually, solutions to their problems. So whether that's you know new web stores or ticketing products or getting people through faster or virtual queuing and, and all that kind of stuff. So a little bit like Marcus, I really felt for him because I too spend a lot of time on the road. This is definitely the longest I've been, probably for five years or so, without being on a plane, which is. I mean, I, it's great because I hate flying, but it's a very strange experience to be stuck at home. Um, and yeah, so for me, though, I, I wasn't so keen. Um, I had a lot of reservations about people reopening um, because I've been a frontline worker. You know, that, that's where I, I started my career. And I think about if I was in that career still, would I be in a position where I had to go back to work? And the answer would have been yes. And I, I, I was very, very worried about, you know, that that kind of those frontline workers um, on the fourth of July when we reopened, about realistically how how kind of safe that would be. Um, and I have a partner who has a health condition um, that you know could potentially be fatal. So we've been very careful about where we'll we'll go out and. You know, you could say we we asked what attractions have you been to since kind of COVID's been an issue, and for me it's really just been outdoor attractions. I'm really not not comfortable just yet going kind of to an indoor attraction. Um, although I think you know what I'm seeing coming out of the industry is, is really positive actually, um, and I think it's a it's a lot safer than I was anticipating it being. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know there's still a lot of attractions that I just Still not quite there with, but I think the, the big outdoor stuff, the zoos, the, the theme parks, etc. The you know that that big outdoor space where we can limit capacity is not too much of a worry for me. And Carly, I I actually thought it was interesting because when we said where have you been, you know the National Trust of Historic Houses, but they also have these other aspects of the property. So you know you don't have to go indoors, and we're starting to yeah. see that as well. Folks that are, are visiting even a lot of themed attractions are just not willing to, to partake in the indoor experiences. Um, and, and some of the attractions understand that and they're just not even opening them. I also like your perspective because uh, I was juggling, uh, we were chuckling back and forth previously. I mean, you're, you're like a world and an international fan. And, and sadly, you have been to every Disney park except for Tokyo. And unfortunately, <laughs> You're, you weren't exactly. able to go during this time period because you, you had yeah. a plan. So. I, I, keep, I keep telling people I'm like the person that bought flip-flops before a holiday weekend, and I'm really sorry to everybody because I had really good plans this year to tick my last Disney park off, and I had this whole Tokyo trip planned, uh, and it involved kind of a very long trip around the world. Uh, so, yeah, and then the world closed. So, sorry, everybody. <laughs> it, it was me. What can you do? We'll try, we will try not to blame you for all of it. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you everyone for, for introducing yourselves. Um, what we're going to kind of start now is just a, a, a chat. Um, so this is what, what we're really trying to, to better understand is your experiences, things that you've learned um, through this journey alongside the, you know, a lot of the folks in the industry that are, that are online. Um, and just hear from your uh, uh, perspective. Uh, what I think I'd like to start with is, you know, when, when attractions closed, you know, in, in the March time frame, um, that was a, a, a really a first time for many attractions to have these like sudden closures, these closures that we're hoping were going to be for two weeks, um, but probably everyone knew we're going to be much longer. Um, and Ben, maybe like to start with you on, on what was your kind of perspective on when that happened and, and kind of your um, experience from a guest point of view of what was going on? So it was it was really um, a very surreal week. I think it was the uh, third week of March or second week of March uh, where basically Disneyland Paris was pretty um, uh, not in denial, but like the experiences were starting to get changed. So uh, the parade stopped and um, some of the experiences stopped and were replaced by more of a cavalcade from a distance. So, you know, the characters weren't as close to the guests and, and you could tell that obviously, you know, things were really starting to change and the fireworks got canceled. Um, and, then, and then the news came that Disneyland Paris was gonna close on the following Monday um and and all these all these choices are obviously made by disney and i think that's kind of like disney's um you know policy around the world they they sort of follow government guidelines so um everyone was kind of looking at the french government what the government was doing and disney was more like a, you know a, a backseat seat writer into all of this i feel like they were really trying to you know, do their best while not closing. And as, you know, as guests were wondering, are they going to close? Because at that point, you know, the pandemic was getting bad, but here in Europe, we, um, and even less in the US, we, we, we couldn't imagine like how, how much of a disruption it was going to be. Um, so we're all kind of wondering if, you know, is maybe Disneyland Paris going to stay open? And eventually they said they were going to close on the following Monday. And, um, um, they are obviously in touch with the French government, but apparently the, the train company um, is more in touch with the French government and started putting on a display on the Friday night in all the train stations in Paris that Disneyland Paris was going to be closed the next day on Saturday. And so Disney had not said anything and people started reporting that the parks were going to close the next morning uh, because it basically said in the train stations and eventually Disney pushed out uh, a press release on Friday night at maybe 10 o'clock uh, saying actually we are going to be closed on Saturday, so it was it was kind of a, uh, a roller coaster because we had already left the parks and we were kind of like, well, see you tomorrow for the last weekend, and that last weekend actually never came. So um, it was quite an interesting week, uh, uh, very surreal, and obviously I think like everyone around the world with their favorite attraction, we never thought they were going to close, and then. Um, and then they closed and then we never thought they were going to be closed that long. So it's, it's been really kind of a journey for, for us guests and especially fans. Um, even with such a big company and a big park as Design Paris, I feel like they were also you know, juggling all those, all those um, guidelines and decisions. And uh, so, so yeah, so it was, it was very surreal to, to watch unfold. It was kind of like a, you know, a, a six part drama series on that week. <laughs> And Carly, I think that you were you were visiting attractions right up uh, before that closure, right? I mean, w what was your pr perspective of kind of how that that closure um, happened there in the United Kingdom and and it, attractions that you might um, uh, have been fans of? So yeah, so it was. I was just thinking actually because it was quite a surreal week. I did three kind of attraction visits that week. I went to the the Barbican Arts Centre, just smack in the middle of London. Um, and held an event, just a bit of a, of a kind of cocktail hour for people. And um, there was lots of kind of, not people didn't want to shake hands. And it was really awkward at the bar because we were all trying to hand sanitize. And we, we didn't really know what to do, but we knew something was wrong, but we just quite, weren't quite there yet. Um, and then the next day, I, I did a trip over to um, the Tate Modern, and I did a, another trip after that to the Museum of London. And again, it was, you know, there was staff on the door, there was hand sanitizing, they were, they were 
machine to sort of tell you what nobody really knew what they should be doing. They sort of had this idea that it was things were bad, but they didn't really know sort of how to deal with it. So yeah, it was it was really surreal to sort of be in a museum that's normally kind of, you know, people laughing and quite a lot of noise going on and this this big kind of city museum. And it was deathly silent, you know, nobody <laughs> It was it was a really strange experience. Um, people didn't want to voluntary close, and I think that you know what Ben was saying about Disneyland Paris is that people didn't want to close voluntarily because they felt like oh well then it's Disney's fault. If you follow what the government is telling you, then you know you, you have to be helped somehow. And I think that lack of government guidance initially was, was quite frightening for people. Because they didn't, they didn't want to sort of be held responsible. They knew something was wrong, and they didn't want to be, remain open. But they just didn't really know what best to do. Yeah, that's. It's interesting about this state. Uh, if we all, it's kind of like you're all going to remember where you were when this happened. I mean, I was with Matthew, and we were in actually Southern California, and it was this one week. I, we were actually at an IAPA event. Uh, it's a leadership summit. So we were literally there with, you know, vice presidents of Disney and Universal and all these locations. And it, there was just this kind of, I was going to say, it's like it was a murmur. Everyone knew something might be happening. And then kind of, I think the dominoes fell. Andrew, um, I like your perspective because um, you actually were pretty active on Twitter during that time period, kind of aggregating the information right around this March 10th, 11th, 12th period of time. What, what, uh, why don't you just share with us what you were reporting on? Yeah, I, uh, I was actually at Disney the last day and, you know, kind of speaking to what everyone else was saying. It was, you know, the last day they were open. And that was one of my last days living in Florida. And everyone, you were, we were waiting in line for like Pandora. And I remember it was just all crowded. And someone's like, this how we get the virus? Like by standing by each other? Like, you know, no one knew back then. Um, and it seems so long ago. But I think, you know, what was really interesting um, as parks uh, close, um, a lot of them, or just attractions in general, I think what was really exciting, so many of them quickly um, jumped into action um, with being able to really try to bring that fun online. Um, and, you know, we saw some, some really great stuff about, um, you know, parks offering like coloring books online or activities uh, and, you know, really trying to um, keep people interested. You know, we saw I, I, you know, so many videos out there that I still see of like penguins walking around various aquariums and exploring the exhibits. Like that was just so great. So I, I think it was really fun as a fan to see how quickly parks jumped into it. But, you know, at the same time, you know, as this was all unfolding, you know, I, I think some, like I, I have the, like the tweet there, you know, a lot of parks were, all, you know, didn't get a lot of credit, but they were already doing a lot of stuff they're doing now. You know, SeaWorld, I remember visiting one of the last few days, and the experience is very similar to what you'll get now. They were wiping down, you know, every uh, every train, um, and, you know, and just were doing a lot of precautions, you know, before this all started. So I think, um, you know, it was just really interesting to see, you know, leading up to the closures, how some, uh, how some folks were acting, and then um, as well as once things started to close, how quickly some folks um, instantly started to like jump on the marketing front and even, you know, uh, yourselves with uh, these webinars, you know, how quickly the industry itself was able to be nimble and still help, you know, people connect and have a good time. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I appreciate this opportunity to look back because I think I forgot, you know, what steps that we were taking as an industry, um, even before, you know, closures to, to, to do the right thing. Um, so I, I, it was it was good to kind of you know go back in the way back machine here and, and remember those times uh, specifically kind of what you know uh, that y'all had described. And Matthew, I was also it's funny because we were we were slowly in North America kind of getting in tune with what was going on as well because I was traveling in Texas right be before that and um, I, I I had been traveling with masks wearing masks on airplanes. Um, over the most of the last of last year of 2019, just as I was better understanding, you know, other types of uh, of transmission, I was also in China uh, right in uh, December of this year of 2019. I mean, 
But I remember going and sharing with uh, attractions about, hey, you should be wearing a mask. You should be, you know, doing these things. And that was like March 5th or 6th, I think it was. So it, it, is, it is weird to kind of go back and see how, how different everything was, but we were starting to move in those directions about keeping people separated, having some physical distancing. Um, now, I want to do, I do want to uh, switch gears to Marcus, though, because Marcus, this was a time when you were really heavily in action. You were, you were kind of, you were an essential worker. They put you on the front line uh, with BBC covering all this. What was it like from your perspective? It was pretty scary, to be honest. Um, my partner is a nurse in uh, the emergency department. She is um, the reality of what was going on, uh, on the front line. And then myself out there filming the stories and still trying to get them to cross to the public to what is going on and stay safe myself. It was, um, it was very scary. Uh, so initially, we didn't have uh, much PPE to go with, and we were just trying to maintain distancing, sort of trying to do interviews and trying to cover the story. Uh, but we were going to, into hospital ward now, and um, at that point, we were being this must go in. Uh, but I don't think necessarily talking to friends who weren't sort of out there. I don't think everybody really took it quite seriously to start with and really grasped just how bad it was. Me at home with my sad partner, we're like, whoa, this is bad. This is, this is only just the beginning. It's going to get so much worse. Um, and we, we just uh, sort of buckled down and prepared for it. Um, but in a way, I think we've both got to the point now blasphemy about it. We've seen it, we've done it, we've experienced it. And I think we've had that time to come to terms with and understand. Uh, and I think the, the mass population around the world are still at the point that we were at sort of two months ago. Yeah, hey, Marcus, um, we're, you're cutting out quite a bit, but it was really important, some of the information that coming in. Uh, by the way, everybody, Marcus is uh, on holiday, and he was having Internet problems connecting, but we really wanted to get his viewpoint. So. We'll do our best to, to have Marcus contribute in the chat. Um, but I think that Marcus brought up some really cute, uh, very important uh, points was, you know, um, his partner's a nurse, she's working in a hospital, and how scary it was to have that perspective that it's it could be pretty dangerous uh, out there. Um, so Ben, to, to add on to that, I mean, what are your, why don't you just chime in a little bit about your perspective as well about kind of the safety aspect of what was going on. Well, the, what I wanted to add from, um, you know, on that, on that topic of closure um, <laughs> is, um, you know, in such a big resort as Disneyland in Paris, uh, the, one of the biggest questions that immediately came up is what do you do with all your guests? Uh, because they were going to close on Monday and they ended up closing on Friday night and having 10,000 of guests in seven hotels. And so what, what Disney did is they, they kept the hotels open for, um, I think, two to three days after the parks were closed, you know, so abruptly. And in that time, um, obviously, they tried to get people home and they tried to help them with their bookings and, and travel arrangement. But also what they did is, you know, throw some free breakfast for everyone, uh, send some characters to the hotels. Um, and just try to, you know, bring out as much magic as possible in those tough times um, because they ended up having, you know, tens of thousands of people stuck back in a resort with nothing to do all day. Uh, so I think that obviously um, I hope this never happens again, but uh, that's such a big question. I think when you, when you have to close abruptly like this, like what do you do with all those people in such a big resort? Um, and in that respect, I think, I think they did, they did pretty okay, uh, you know, given, the circumstances and that all this basically happened overnight. And I think a lot of cast members woke up on Saturday and were told, oh, you're not going to work today. You're, you know, just stay home. Um, so that must have been quite, uh, quite the news for them as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the, the little things that attractions can do, I think, go certainly a long way during this. So, so you know, obviously, Ben, there, there were 
they probably realize that, you know, we have a heck of a lot of food on hand um, that if we're going to be closed, we're not going to be able to use. So immediately kind of understanding that and saying, what's the best way that we can, we can do this? And, and if it's that we put out a, a, a free buffet, um, are we any worse off? No, we're actually 10 times better because the guest experience. So I think that's really great that, that that's one of the things that you picked up on. Uh, Marcus is, is working on reconnecting right now, but the, the one other thing I just wanted to point out from one of the things that, that he had mentioned um, on, on back on March 26 was, you know, being on the front line and experiencing um, this pandemic, um, it, his, his last sentence of, of being able to get back into an attraction, being able to get back in there, it was what, it was the light that they were looking for. And I think for so many folks um, in, in the industry, that's the case, right? You know, the uh, people coming to our attractions is the highlight of, of their week, their year, their, their um, vacation. Uh, um, so I think, you know, getting back into those experiences was critical. And, and so I'd like to kind of step in and, and talk with each of y'all uh, about whenever we, we knew that, hey, um, maybe the circuit breaker was coming toward an end or the, the, the lockdowns were kind of going to start being lifted. How did you prepare to return? Like what were some of the things that, that were maybe holding you back um, from, from wanting to go back to an attraction? What did you need to hear to feel like, hey, I, this is something um, I want to try? And Andrew, I'll, I'll start with you on, on that if that's okay. Yeah, I think so. I I kind of eased into it by um, uh, going up to the Cleveland Zoo. I was living in Ohio for a few months uh, in my transition to moving, and the Cleveland Zoo had um, a drive-through exhibit, um, and so I I felt that was a a good way to kind of test the waters, if you will, um, and kind of get back out there and get back excited about attractions. So. Um, that's how I kind of like I you know you saw on the screen I went to a lot of attractions but it was kind of eased back into things that way um, by going to that and kind of seeing okay like you know we can still go to these these uh, these places we all love these attractions that we love and still have a really good time might be a little bit different experience than we were used to you know six months ago a year ago but overall we can still have a good time so I think that got me I think you know to be transparent I think before that I was kind of like well, Am I even going to want to go to the parks this year? It's going to be so different. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be, you know, all these hoops to jump through to, to get into the facilities. Um, and then I went to the Cleveland Zoo and I was like, you know, I had to make a reservation online. I, you know, had to, you know, I'm driving through the zoo versus uh, walking, but still having a great time. The elephants look just as, looks just as great from my car as if I was standing on the same path. So I think that really kind of uh, re-energized me to go, okay, even if there's a lot to do, you know, to make a reservation and you have to actually think out before you go to a park or attraction, um, you know, it's still worth going to. That's great. Carly, one of the things um, maybe you could help us understand. So we, we've seen um, when we've we've looked at some of the things that uh, several of the attractions in the UK have done this, this we're good to go. I'd love to understand from your perspective, what does that mean? And, and does it does it help you in feeling comfortable in visiting an attraction? I think um, just in terms of for those who aren't familiar with the scheme, it, it's, it's like a, an audit for a tourist attraction to go through. So they can have somebody come in from Visit England and audit their attraction and say, is this um, the way that they're operating safe? You know, are there things that they could do or uh, that they could change? So things like, you know, um, I know one of the sites having had lots of evening festivals planned. Well, at the moment, you can't have um, anything other than acoustic music. You have to make sure that, you know, you're not encouraging dancing, all this kind of stuff. So, but they managed to hold their evening festivals with acoustic sets social distancing markers on the floor, you know, they're having picnics and parties and, and that kind of thing. So they're able to go to visit England and say, if we did this, is, is that acceptable? And that's where they, they're getting this we're good to go from. As to realistically outside of the industry, whether that means something to people, I'm not really convinced. I mean, I, I just, the innovating system behind it, it's just a, a check. So I'm thinking about something similar like, um, food hygiene ratings, which, you know, people are really comfortable with and understand. And, you know, you can score anything, but you have to display it. I think something like that would be long-term more appropriate. Uh, you know, how how good are your processes? You know, how effective are they? 
Um, but for the moment, I think in terms of that short turnaround time, I think it's the best the best we can hope for, really. Got it. Ben, did did you have any reservations when you before you 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 walked through uh, the gates at Disneyland Paris for the first time after lockdown? Yes. Yeah. So on my end, I live in I live in the UK. So for me, maybe the one of the biggest factors was travel. Um, you know how to get there. And your star uh, did a did a good job. Uh, local French transport was a bit more of a challenge. Uh, but when it comes to the parks, um, yeah, so from, from day one, we had to make reservations. Uh, they opened, I think, a uh, week or two before opening day. Um, and um, capacity was very low. And what they did is they had uh, two cast days over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And then they had two AP days on Mondays and on Monday and Tuesday. So cast days helped sort of, you know, getting things in order and fixing things and trying things because obviously it's your own employees and their families. So I guess it's easier to um, not make mistakes, but it's easier to test and adjust with that kind of crowd. And then I think on Monday, AP previews were, were quite popular, but also very limited in capacity in the parks. And in that way, you get to get all the people who are super excited to get through the gates before you know official opening and not only do the APs feel privileged but also you sort of like get this out of the way in a sense that you don't have all those people taking all your reservation for opening day and no one's able to buy tickets for example so they have different buckets um, AP day tickets hotel packages and all those buckets are it seems uh, readjusted in real time over an online system with calendars where you can see which days are available, which days are not available, in the same way that they're doing, I believe, in uh, Walt Disney World. Um, and so it is, it is a bit random sometimes because they adjust it. But uh, yeah, so you just make your reservation. And um, the, the good thing actually that happened uh, with this whole reservation system is that it's really pushed Disneyland Paris to uh, bringing some new technology when it comes to sort of ticketing it's not ticketing per se because you still have to buy a ticket but it is kind of a ticket that you have to reserve online um, and um, it's really made them bring out those new terminals that were i think uh, phones um, to scan qr codes that people have just on their phones very easily in an email um, and Disney Paris hasn't really historically been very on the forefront of technology because of you know historical reasons that the budgets were never really there and and this crisis has really helped them or pushed them, forced them really to bring out those measures um, and this, this new technology that, that really the park needs for a lot more things and that hopefully they will keep for the future. Um, and I think there was, there was a question about that um, uh, from the viewers is that, you know, um, about trying to build a better future instead of trying to get back to where we were. And so, for example, I hope this technology stays. Um, they've been trying, they've been, you know, uh, trialing some new turnstiles that are um, faster, more hands-free, and this is taking forever. They've been there for months and months, and I feel like now they're going to have to deploy them faster because it gets, it gets people in faster, which means less queues, less people stuck together, um, and, and all those things help with, you know, prevention and safety, but also on the long term, this helps the resort getting better technology and better processes and better, you know, better stuff for us. We, we get to have a better experience, hopefully in the long term, and hopefully they keep all those measures. It, it, that, it's interesting you say that. And yeah, it was uh, uh, Char, Charlie that said uh, he was at an Intex webinar back in May, and the quote is from Kate Fulton who said, are we missing an opportunity to shape a future that we want rather than trying to get back to what was? And I mean, that's pretty amazing. And, and I think so much of this has been looked at through the lenses of, oh, it's got to be the same. But the reality is like my, personally, my wife is like, this is the way it should be. I don't want, I don't want people on top of me in a queue line. I want to feel space. And, and um, you know, she's as, as crazy as it is, my wife has loved the opportunity to really decompress and stay at home and to venture out when she's ready in a safe manner. Um, but I, I, I think it's very interesting that uh, we can't look backwards anymore because it's gone. 
And we need to think of what the technology shift is going to be. I was listening to a webinar last week with um, the vice president. Uh, uh, it was like uh, MGM Grand in Vegas. And all the changes that they're looking at, things like um, reserving a, a, a table to, to gamble. Like, we never would have thought about that in the past. Um, but they're able to do more, he said, in the last three months than they did in the last three years because they felt they had to advance the technology. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Now, Terry, the other thing I think the humanist side of this, because you had mentioned, um, this is a, a time to look at your frontline staff differently as well. Yeah, so I was going to say, I just I want to pick up on the, the frontline staff thing, but to speak to, to Ben's comment as well about, you know, that changing in technology, I think we will see a huge in we've we've already been seeing it you know people are being replaced by automation and it's happening in every industry all over the world but actually we're we're going to progress that very quickly now and i think where people are losing jobs um in, you know we've talked about the, the facial recognition i think where we're saying at the minute people are being laid off from those jobs is actually we won't see the return of a lot of those jobs they will be automated out because there's a cost savings to be had and at the moment, it's going to be very easy for those businesses to get more capex because they can kind of hide it in all of the other stuff that's going on. And actually, we will see a, a real push towards more technology and attractions, I think, and more automation. I think that, that's inevitable, and we're just going to see that a, a sped up version of that. Um, and then, yeah, also to, to kind of front line workers, I, I think one of the, the last conversations I had with somebody from an attraction before England's lockdown, I said, you know, what it always made me think of is, you know, I've been asking people for years to think more about how they protect their frontline staff. I think everybody who's worked in an attraction will know your frontliners routinely will get sick in indoor attractions during the winter months, you know, from, from diseases that we've had around a very long time. And, you know, they handle cash and they're dealing with support, you know, people all the time. It's actually, how do we take care of those people better? And I, I'm hoping that we might see some improvements around here, that, that those frontline roles being more appreciated and, and people taking better care of their, their teams because it's becoming really obvious that they're vital to delivering a great experience. And to pick point. up on your, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Uh, yeah, to pick up on Randy's comment about the experience, and I think we'll talk about more about the experience of actually being in the park since reopening uh, in a moment, but um, it's been amazing. It's been amazing to not have people stuck to you. And I think when we say the future, it's the future in terms of technology, but it's also the future in terms of experience. Like, let's have new tools so we're not all just stuck together in one BQ. Let's have new tools so we can just walk in somewhere and a table is waiting for us. And and all those things that are done now for health and safety are actually opportunities for the future to have better systems and to give a better guest experience. Um, something that maybe, like you said, that we may not have thought of. And, uh, and it was really nice to be in the parks and not have anyone within two meters of me. You know, it, it, it was just uh, really refreshing in a way. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a lot of photos from Disneyland Paris. I, I don't have kids, and so I tend to travel to big theme parks out of season. And uh, people showing photos of it, and I'm thinking, well, I just go in January, and it always looks like that. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> Disneyland Paris in January, but, but, you know, there's no one within two meters of you, but it's deathly cold. So, hey, but Carly, <laughs> I I hate to throw this curveball, in, but there is no like season anymore. I mean, my well, children yeah. started school on Friday at home or remotely, so I think that's going to change everything. Well, we're going to start seeing people go whenever they want to go. And yeah, and I, they... I kind of uh, would hope a little bit that actually it, it sort of ruins seasonality a little bit because people do have to pre-book and they have to. Um, you're going to be able to balance that demand a little bit more, but actually maybe it will be better seasonality for attractions. They'll be able to plan their staffing better. There'll be, you know, less peaks and troughs, and maybe it could be a positive. 
Hey, uh, Andrew, uh, one of the questions that came in, um, and, and since you've visited several attractions so far, uh, I wanted to, to get your opinion on it. Is, so a lot of attractions that, that Ka Catherine has mentioned that, you know, when they're reopening in the first couple days or in the beginning, they may not be offering discounted tickets. Um, ha have you seen that as a drawback from a guest of, hey, I'm not going to visit these places if they're not, ha a, a, um, you know, doing discounts or what have you heard from that? I would say I, I don't think it's necessary uh, uh, to do discounts. I think it's just it's more. I'll flip it around a little bit and say I think it's more important to be clear about what you're offering at that time. If you if your facility is 100% fully operational and you can get the full experience, I don't necessarily think you need to do discounts um, to to get people back in. But what I th where I've seen a lot of um, you know, and I even personally have felt it a little bit. If, when I did pay a full price and I show up and half the stuff is closed and you know I wasn't notified of that in advance um, or uh, you know just just kind of various aspects around that of like um, you know if, if I'm paying full price I'm kind of I know things are going to be a little bit different today but I would have you know I would have expected a full experience so I think that was one of the one of my frustrations when I, I visited a park recently is. Um, charged full price, went there, and most of the attractions, I'd say, you know, uh, more than three quarters of the park was closed. And I just felt like that wasn't, it wasn't communicated properly. So I think, you know, if you don't want to discount, I don't think you need to. I think it's just about being open and honest. I know the worst thing you want to do is throw up the banner on the website or on Facebook and say, hey, our signature ride is not open, or, you know, this great indoor exhibit that we're known for is temporarily closed. Because, uh, yeah, it's probably going to turn some folks off, but for the folks that still come, you could probably, you're going to get a better, you know, better reception from them and probably be able to charge them the full price. You know, I, I've seen, you know, a lot of the Cedar Fair parks um, be very open and honest, posting lists, you know, that change daily or weekly on what attractions they are currently operating and which ones they're not. And I think that it, it's disappointing to go out, that ride's not open, but I appreciate that level of transparency. So when I'm paying whatever I'm paying to get in and I visit that attraction, I, I know what to expect. That's great. It's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so obviously when you walked back through, you know, into those attractions for the first time, um, there was probably a lot of things that were different, right? You know, there's the, the social distancing and there's masks and there's things like that. But what I was wondering is if, um, you know, Ben, maybe you could share, like, what was, what was the one most significant um, change when you returned to the parks that you noticed? And what was your thoughts on it? Was it good? Was it bad? Kind of, how did you feel about that change? So I think, I think the most obvious one, is all the social distancing markers and signs and cues. And, you know, we uh, we got to see some previews and we got to see what they were uh, doing. Um, so it was kind of a, a big question because, you know, everyone was kind of curious to see how that was gonna work on the large scale. Cause it's one thing to see one marker on the floor, but it's a different thing to see uh, three kilometers of plexiglass because that's what they've installed in all the queues. Um, so that was kind of the big question. And honestly, um, uh, getting there, I, I thought they I thought they managed to strike the right balance. Um, of course, the, my big worry as a you know Disney Parks design fan was that it was just going to ruin the whole <laughs> the whole magic and the whole landscape having all those things. Um, the way they did it is they first they hired their um, famous Imagineers to design something that was really coherent. So uh, when it comes to the fonts, the signs, the shapes, the, the images and everything was really coherent between the floor markings, the sign on the windows, uh, there was a color scheme through each park, there was uh, you know, a sort of like a coherence I think is, and so in that way, um, it felt less out of place because you kind of know already what it is. So yes, you see it everywhere, but it all kind of works together. Um, and even the plexiglass and the cues, of course, it looks like a crazy, um, you know, rat maze in there. Um, but once you go through it, um, it's fine. Uh, you know, you, you and, and I think also you, you're happier than you're separated from people and you, you're just willing to let it go uh, because, you know, it keeps you safe. And, and I think that was also, I think one point that, you know, I, I, thought, I thought it was going to be too much, but actually once you get there, especially after four months of, you know, let's face it, being a little scared of being, you know, we've all been at home and we've all watched the news and 
you go out in the world and um, and and you just don't know what to expect. Um, it was really nice to see actually how much they had done. Um, I was afraid that it was going to be too much, but once you're there, it really makes you feel safe. Um, and so and so like my 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 take on it is like it's never too much, you know, just just go all out and um, and don't be afraid to just do too much. Uh, they it, after a while, people get used to it, and they'll be. I think guests are more grateful that Disney is doing everything they can to keep them safe, um, uh, rather than just you know complaining that you know you can't come close to the characters or you can't do all this or that. I think that most people who are willing to go this summer are the type of people that will forgive uh, the attraction uh, for all the measures that they put in. I think uh, and, you know, and I think Marcus. Said, same time, like uh, said earlier, um, you know, uh, that they were in, in one of his tweets, uh, they were so happy to be open, you know, uh, thank you for being open. And I think that's really the feeling that you get from people, or at least the people that are willing to come this summer um, to attractions. It's just so, so yes, there are a lot of measures. Um, it's a bit, um, not shocking, but it's a bit surprising at first. When you get there, you're like, wow, this, this is what it looks like now. Um, but after a while, you actually learn to appreciate them. And 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 you know you you get back to the fun because uh, the fun the fun hasn't changed so um, so it, was, it 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 was it was really okay in the end. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just build on that. I, I you know perfect. It's a, we, I swear we didn't plan this transition that the fun hasn't changed. I think that was one of my you know bigger takeaways um, going into it. Um, you know I think you know we're all used to now you know to to go into a facility or attraction. You know, you have to reserve a time in advance. You have to do all these things that are completely different than, you know, six months ago. But once you get in, like that was my, when I, when I started going back to these attractions, it was, it, it sounds silly, but like once I got back in there, I got on like the rides and it's like this roll COVID didn't change the track on this roller coaster. It's still a really great time. It throws you around and you know, you're, you're laughing and having a great time. That didn't change. And I think, um, you know, there, a lot of stuff has changed leading up to the entry of the park, but you can still have a really great time at the facility. So that was kind of one of my first first impressions that I got when I went back was just, oh yeah, the rides haven't changed. You know, this is this is still an amazing roller coaster. I, I have fun riding this. I, I want to continue to ride this. So I think that was one of the things I took away, and one of the things I you know uh, threw out to throw out to all the attractions out there is. You know, don't be afraid to continue to talk about the fun, the, the fun being back. Um, that's uh, Six Flags or Cedar Fair. Someone said that because I think it's it, it's true. It's still there. So, you know, it, it might just feel like there's a lot of hoops to jump through when someone's sticking a temperature gauge in your face and you're filling out health paperwork in advance online beforehand. But once you get there, it's, it's still a really, really great time. Um, you know, and you kind of, you know, attractions were made to let us forget about the outside world and you you're still forgetting about the outside world when you're flying on a roller coaster at 75 miles per hour. You forget about that, forget about everything going on. So, um, and I would just add, I think one of the other impressions I took away, you know, kind of going back to the technology piece a little bit too, was just how super impressive some of the, some of the upgrades have been. Uh, you know, this is not a knock on Six Flags by any means, but um, I had the smoothest entry process I ever had going to a theme park ever. Um, when I was at Six Flags the other day, um, and that's in, that's while we're taking my temperature and um, you know in this whole new environment, and you know I've been to many of parks and no one's done it, COVID or not COVID, as smoothly as they have you know done now with this you know these really high tech technologies. You know you're going through a metal detector where I didn't have to take anything out of my pocket. I didn't even know my temperature was getting checked. They said just walk through this tunnel and walked through the tunnel and they took my temperature and you know did the metal detection all in one and that was the most seamless experience uh so it's like you know as i said in my tweet all attractions need to be looking at six flags for this because it, it just made it such a seamless experience and i and that was a lot of the first impressions i had too was um you know credit where credit's due to these uh, attractions were making some probably difficult changes or uh you know in this case probably a, a big investment um but it all, you know, I was really impressed about how well stuff was done. You know, similarly, was at Zoo Atlanta recently, and the zoo is set up, um, as, like I think a lot of zoos are right now, in a in a one way fashion. And you know, at first, it's like, oh, that's that's going to be different. But then I walked out, and uh, my wife and I looked at each other, and we said, 
that really made sense because in a zoo, there's so much going on all over. You never know which direction to go. And they, they went through this whole process of setting up um, directional signs and, and um, you know, making this really good flow. And my first time there, I was able to see everything because they set it up as so. So, you know, I, I give, that was probably my first impression is, you know, a lot of stuff has changed, but a lot of stuff, you know, is really, really impressive what, you know, how creative parks have got about stuff. So, um, Andrew, I, it's funny because I see these pictures here and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the movie Total Recall. It's like, <laughs> ah, so far in the future, it's never going to happen. And it's, it's like it's already, it's here. Um, I'm curious, though, about like what those other expectations are, because you talked a little bit about open communication. And to ask, uh, to ask a question that was fielded uh, in our Q&A is, what is the expectation about indoor attractions? I mean, do you as a guest feel that um, it's appropriate to say, hey, we're not going to have any indoor attractions open? Um, just what are your thoughts about it? Because a lot of these rides that we go on these days are kind of a hybrid as well. They have indoor elements and these, these show buildings. I mean, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on Indoor attractions, do you need to open them? Do, will the guests be comfortable if you say, we're not going to open them? And, and maybe what is the ramifications financially? Should it be a discount or not? So I'll start it with you and then maybe ask everybody else what their thoughts are. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on can you still get that experience outside, you know, at a zoo where you walk in, you know, the Zoo Atlanta again, you know, the, the indoor elephant exhibit was closed. But the elephants were all out, so you know I still got to see the elephants. So, you know, no harm, no foul there. Didn't you know? But you know, going to some of these other attractions where I think where it gets a little murky to your point is when you have some indoor attractions that are open, and then you have signs in front of others saying that it's closed because of you know health reasons. It, it, you start going, but I just rode an indoor ride a couple hundred yards that way. So I think just from an expectation standpoint. I'm going into a lot of it going, hey, I know indoor stuff probably won't be open, but I think just from a, a guest perspective, you know, if you are closing it because for budgetary reasons or labor reasons, um, you kind of have to just come out and say that or be consistent because I think that's where I, you know, that's where I struggle with in some of the attractions is, you know, you can't say this indoor ride's closed for COVID, but the one right down the street from it or right, you know, right down the pathway from it is open and still going. And maybe there's a bigger reason, I, but from a guest, that's at least my perception. But, I mean, uh, to add to that, I think um, we had talked about this on a previous webinar, rotating rides is okay, right? From a straight labor perspective, as long as you just are upfront about it and say, look, to, to offer everyone the best experience, we're going to, rotate rides around, but you have to communicate in advance what those expectations are. Did you see that at any attractions that you went to? I am i don't mean to deviate from the indoor question. I'm just curious more about the, the labor. Did you see any places where this ride was only open for X number of hours? Yeah, I, I saw that a, a little bit, especially at some of the smaller facilities, like yeah. a fun spot, you know, they, they, they're they rotating stuff around. And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's fair, you know, even, uh, even with some of the bigger rides, you know, the everyone knows, you know, the, you know, the attractions are not super crowded right now. So I think it's not like you're waiting in three hour lines and that's a huge benefit. So I think, you know, knowing that, hey, if this ride's only open from this time to this time and then this one's open, I think it's just being clear up front about that, um, you know, especially for someone, you know, who might just drop in for the afternoon or drop in after work or something and it might have the expectation of, oh, I'm going to go ride my favorite ride or see my favorite attraction um, when I come after six o'clock and that ride was is only a, a, a 10 to two ride. I think just being, being open and uh, upfront about, you know, the times and hours, it, you know, if you go that route, it is, you know, like I said, it's hard to communicate that stuff out because you don't want to turn away people, but I think, um, any people you turn away, the benefit outweighs it of being, you know, making sure those folks who are coming are having the right expectations. Hey, uh, Carly, one of the questions that had come in from Ruth was was around cultural and historical um, institutions. So we we talked a little bit about kind of the, the the joy that a lot of folks get at attractions. But from a guest perspective, what would what would be your primary motivation for visiting a cultural or a historical institution during these dangerous and uncertain times? So I I think 
it's it's a tough one because I guess the the issue for me would be what is your mission as as a historical or a cultural institution? What is the thing that you have that people are getting from you? Because Andrew and, and Ben are, are right. You know, if you're going to ride a roller coaster, roller coasters are always going to be fun. But actually, is there something in your historical collection or, or whatever it might be in a museum that actually one might be quite challenging at the moment? You know, there's going to be maybe depictions of things in the past that you're going to find quite challenging. You know, people are in situations where they're stressed and there's high emotions running, and you know, those types of things can can be quite provocative. But actually, if people support your mission before COVID, they're probably going to still support your mission today. So um, one of the things that I really enjoyed actually about lockdown, um, and it seems weird to say I enjoyed something about lockdown, but you know, was was I could have a lot of um, experiences that not not necessarily the same experience that I would have had in a museum or a, or a historical attraction, but that actually was much more accessible in, in my home. So thinking about the tape. Tate Modern in, in London was has a series of things called Tate Late, which is they open late into the evening on a Friday night. Um, and that's really about attracting a different market. So, you know, they serve alcohol, they do um, different events within that, they have silent discos. And obviously they, they can't they can't do that. But through lockdown, they started televising a lot of their content. So, you know, people who could never get to the Tate to experience that could actually then experience it online. And I think it probably brought them more visitors than than would ever go through the door for that kind of experience. And I think to to think that the only people that have an affinity to your mission, whatever that mission might be, to think that only the people who come through your door care, I think is is a really missed opportunity. And I think those people who already came through your door who support your mission will continue to do so. But Maybe actually is now the time to think who would support my mission, but doesn't have the opportunity to come through the door. You know, are there mem you know sectors of society that I may be missing out on? And can I reach out to them in a different way? Um, because that for me would be the, the motivation. Is I might be a little bit afraid to go into central London where a lot of my favourite museums are, but I still really want to support their cause and I still love their, their content. How do I how do I get that without having to venture into you know one of the most populated cities? in the world would be a big thing. So I think concentrate on what you're providing, concentrate on what the mission is, and what are you doing to support that mission? Because people will come back if you give them a good enough reason to, and you make them feel safe about it. But they're not gonna just come back because you know you put some hand sanitizer out and people are wearing that. It's just not gonna happen. You've got to give them a reason to spend their time with you. I think I think Carly make a great point that's kind of been highlighted by by all the panelists today is that the communication coming from the attractions to the guests is going to be really critical in that you know kind of overcoming objections between coming to the site or what do I expect when I get there or what that experience is and um, so I, I think one of the questions I wanted um, to ask the panelists today is we've seen um, a lot of communication about kind of like what reopening looks like. But even after reopening, um, every it seems like every attraction that I've seen <laughs> had to make some level of adjustment, whether that's days of operation, hours of operation, um, what's required before you come. Some people have walked away from reservations. Some people started them late. So you know all those types of things. So um, I kind of wanted to to see if there was. Um, communication um, or wins or people that you think really nailed it. I know we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, Cedar Fair kind of doing that joint, you know, full full company um, update or any specific sites um, that you think did did really well in kind of managing your expectations or, um, you know, expressing that change in a way that you kind of knew what was coming and at least could decide then, you know, what that looks like. Um, and, and if you could talk a little bit and, and what changes you've seen that have been good um, and, and what ones that um, you think might you might want to see um, one question we got specific specifically that we've seen a lot of our attractions do is is reducing their operating calendar so by days or hours um, and what would you all as guests kind of prefer to see in that um, so I know Andrew you have some thoughts on that that kind of operation schedule but you know really like how's and then and what have you guys appreciated from our attractions that are doing that you know midway down the <laughs> midway down the path we hey, got to change yeah, I would say um, I think just communicate. Obviously, everything's still fluid, and 
I think everyone understands if you're going to have to, you know, change your operating schedule. I think just being uh, open and uh, and communicate that in advance. You know, I've looked at going to some attractions and I ended up not going because they're only posting their schedule three or four days out in advance, which I know allows them to be flexible you know, based on the situation. But you know, if you're trying to plan something, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And um, it, you know, I would say reservations as well. Uh, you know, if you don't feel like you have to use them, if you have to use them for legal reasons, you know, to maintain capacity. But you know, if I, I feel like if I see a lot of parks holding back on them, rightfully so. You know, if if you're not going to if you're going to make me jump through all these hoops to make a reservation and I show up and you're not going to care that I made a reservation, then it's slightly frustrating to go, then why did I spend five minutes digging up my pass, you know, figuring out what time I want to come if I'm just going to show up and, you know, you're not going to ask. So that's from a reservation standpoint. And then I would just add from an hour standpoint, um, you know, I do work a normal nine to five job and I always, you know, this is super selfish kind of rant here, but I, hopefully it, it helps um, kind of share some insight um, from a lot of folks I've talked to as well is, you know, a lot of us work, you know, nine to five and, you know, I always love, you know, stopping at a park on my way home, nothing like, you know, bad day at the office, riding, you know, a giant roller coaster a few times and grabbing a beer to, to kind of make the day uh, uh, better. But I think a lot of attractions naturally just, you know, they want to keep the, the one shift mentality of, you know, uh, you know, nine to five or 10 to six as their operating schedule. Um, but I would say, you know, I would challenge uh, attractions out there for, you know, the folks that like myself who, who do work during the day, maybe be flexible on the, you know, I, we were just talking a moment ago about some, you know, some attractions that had like an evening event. Um, I would say, you know, if you are reducing your hours, don't always feel like you have to maybe reduce them from the evening down. I would challenge you maybe see, could you, you know, open later in the day? Um, you know, we've seen that in the past, a lot of Middle East uh, attractions open, you know, from like three o'clock to midnight to kind of beat the heat. I think we can, you know, maybe take a learning from that. And it's like, uh, I love to, uh, you know, be able to go ride some roller coasters after work. If, if the parks, you know, maybe one day a week were open 10 and two to 10 instead of, you know, nine to five or something like that. So I'd encourage, um, you know, maybe be a little bit creative with the hours and not always have to trim from the evening um, because maybe some of those folks who previously came in the evening um, you know, we're in the similar situation of, hey, I'm stopping after work or I'm taking in the kids after school and school back in session, closing at six o'clock is going to make it hard for any parents to take uh, take their kids to an attraction after school. That's a great point, Andrew. Uh, one, one other thing I, I also wanted to, to go into or ask, um, and Ben, maybe you can help me with this one, is one of the big things that attractions yeah. are big about are making memories. Right, they're making memories with your family. They're creating this um, this experience that that whenever the kids go off to college, we're going to still remember when we went and we did this sort of things. And and I think as a result of the this pandemic, some of those memories are much different. Maybe they're more unique now, and and these will be much more memorable. Um, but like you know, that opportunity for um, a, a child to meet Mickey for the first time, uh, an opportunity to, to to take a picture with Shrek or a thing like that aren't there as much. What has been your perspective and what you've seen and how those are different now? And do you think they're different for the better or the worse? So I think, um, you know, I think just, just like uh, closing attractions or changing times, I think uh, the, the experience is something that attractions have to be upfront about. And one of the big thing, obviously, like you said, at Design Paris is meeting characters and you're very much used to seeing the kids running to the princesses and all. obviously all that cannot happen currently. And what Disney has done is they've been pretty upfront at explaining their new system, which is called selfie spots. And basically you have the characters either on a stage or behind a robe in some sort of setting and guests come in um, and take a selfie. So it's it's a selfie, but if you if your family is with you, obviously one of the one of the person in the group can take the photo of the others, but cast members cannot touch people's phones. And also, currently, under you know the current French guidelines, you have to keep your mask on. So, it is definitely a different experience. Um, we've had a lot of different reactions. Uh, personally, I love characters, but I am maybe not so huge on having that perfect photo in that perfect setting. I don't have kids, so for me, 
it's actually a great way to see other characters with minimal weight because this whole system is much faster than having a whole family that's going to take all those photos and have the kids and have this and that. So for me, for example, it works really well. But I think it's important for every attraction to be upfront about what they're offering so that visitors can decide if this is something for them or not. And based on all our photos, we've had people saying, you know, I'm not coming, I don't like this, I don't want my my uh, holiday photos and my memories to have the mask on, uh, I don't want this. And But also, obviously, a lot of people are still going, and a lot of people are very happy with an understanding of of the way things are. So it is, it is definitely a different experience. I don't know if the selfie spot system is really something that should stay for the long term, because you are really just taking a photo of you with the characters in the background. It is not ideal. Um, but maybe out of this could come up a different system for people like me who want to take photos of the characters, but not necessarily do a whole photo shoot. So maybe they could have some kind of hybrid system where at times you just see the characters and can take the photos. And at other times it's the time for all the families and everyone to actually meet them and do a whole photo shoot. So it's, it is important, I think, for attractions to be upfront. Also, people see it on our feeds, the fans, the visitors. Now, with social media, it's quite easy to get a, an idea of what the experience is. Uh, but it's also important for the brand and for the, for the attraction to show right from the start so that you don't have disappointed guests and also guests who complain or guests who don't want to comply with the requirements. So, the guests in Paris have been pretty good about wearing masks, but there's been a lot of questions about wearing masks in photos. like. If you go in front of the castle, for example, can you take your mask to take a quick photo? And, you know, the official answer is no, no, you cannot. So it's something to know and it's something to be upfront about uh, for, for the attractions to really explain what the guests are going to get. But um, it's been going well um, with Disney in Paris, at least. Uh, they've, made, they've made some videos showing this new experience, um, some official videos, you know, a little bit with some nice music and everything to really give an idea to everyone what to expect. But it's important, it's important that anyone who visits knows what to expect. That's great. I, I think uh, what, what I guess, you know, a, a large attraction like Disneyland Paris obviously had two decisions to make, right? Do I not have this and because I can't have it the way it was before? Or do I have it, but it's a little bit different? And it sounds like it's, it's probably better to have it being different. Um, obviously, we would love a situation where it was what it was. Um, but, you know, innovating on that for the time um, seems, seems appropriate. And some of them, some of them are really lovely. Uh, they have, you know, um, at Meet Mickey, we usually actually go into a room and meet Mickey. Uh, they put them on a stage, um, and they do all sorts of fun stuff. They have, um, they have props, and they do some, you know, magic and stuff. And you get to walk to the front of the stage, and they, they still wave at you. Uh, you can talk to them uh, through your mask, uh, <laughs> and they, they respond. They do all sorts of fun things, and they take funny poses. And so the, the magic is still there. Of course, it's it's not what we've known from Disney for decades. It, it, it can't be, but, but it's, still, it's still lovely. I had a really lovely time there. It was really heartwarming also to see how um, happy the characters were to be back and all the cast members who managed the attractions. And I think all this, all this excitement and joy to be back after all those months also is, has, is becoming part of the experience. Well, I, this this talk has been really great for me. I, I haven't uh, personally uh, visited any attractions yet, so I, I've kind of lived a little bit through your stories, and I really appreciate um, uh, Ben, Andrew, Carly, and, and Marcus for for being taking us on that journey. Um, I think you, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up today's discussion here, but I, I want to share with the audience that I, I think that this is going to be a topic that we're going to want to hear about more. I think it, it, seeing seeing all of the hard work that that attraction industry professionals are doing day in and day out play out in the real world from those that are consuming it is really one of the key things for us to learn from. So I think we'll we'll be chatting more. I would encourage you to to visit um, um, everyone's uh, Twitter feeds or sites um, also to get some more information uh, because I think you'll you'll be able to see a lot of, of things that, that folks liked and, and areas where maybe they found some improvement. And we'll share those links um, after the fact. So again, thanks a ton, Ben, Andrew, Carly, and Marcus for joining us today.
Uh, I know this is at all hours uh, across the globe, but we appreciate it. For everyone else, um, if you'd like more information on, uh, you know, getting informed on these webinars, feel free to send us an email at marketing at gatewayticketing.com. Um, and if you want to go ahead and sign up for our next webinar, go ahead and snap a shot of that QR code. Um, go ahead and, and sign up for it. We'll be back in two weeks on August 19th uh, for, for a, another fun discussion. Um, and Carrie, Randy, Greg, many thanks uh, as well to y'all. And we'll see y'all out soon.